Ребята, а сейчас у нас снова доклад на английском языке. Я приглашаю на сцену Google Developer эксперта в области виртуальной реальности из Праги, Ник Пейдж. You are welcome. Ник работает в сфере дизайна около 25 лет, расскажет об опыте взаимодействия виртуальной реальности с пользователем. Виртуальная реальность продолжает свое шествие в мире новых технологий. Ник, you are welcome. Hi. Maybe on the stage? On the stage? Okay, yeah. why not? Thank you. Hi again. Uh, I'm Nick Page. I am a UX uh, strategist and uh, developer uh, designer. Uh, I think about experience uh, a little differently than maybe a lot of UX people do. Uh, I think mostly about emotion. I'm not all that interested in the pixels, uh, in the design of the interface exactly. That's one of the last things I usually think about. Mostly, I'm interested on the emotional impact on the experience that the design will produce. Experience really is the sum of emotions uh, that a person feels when interacting with your organization, with your company, uh, your school, or whatever you're designing for. Uh, so when I started thinking about the UX of VR and AR, this is what I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking so much about flicker rates and refresh rates and uh, all of that, but what people feel like when they're actually using uh, the system. Uh, I can't see a monitor. Oh, here's one, so I have to look behind me. I don't, I don't, so you'll have to excuse me a little bit. This, uh, I thought of, I think is the first VR experience people had. Uh, what it did, obviously it had practical applications, it, uh, you know, made us warm, chased away the mean animals at night and all of that. But I think more, it drew people together. Uh, and it really is sort of a VR experience. Think of all the poetry and the literature uh, and maybe even your own thoughts when you stare into a fire and you start seeing things, uh, almost hallucinations. Some people see entire stories play out in the flames. This is such a powerful draw that we've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, but people still do it today. Even though we have mobile phones, we have VR, we have everything, we have lights, we don't need this anymore. Uh, but it's one of the things people look forward to uh, in the summertime, and it still captivates. So it's right there, it's a very powerful thing, the simplest VR we've ever had. Uh, I thought more about this, uh, how VR evolved in, uh, in, in, our, in our history, the way we interact with things. Uh, and this is pretty much the next one that I thought of. Uh, we jumped two, three hundred thousand years. <laughs> uh, about a hundred years ago, we started staring at wooden boxes uh, with the whole family. The box didn't change, it didn't do anything. It talks to us. The box told us stories, it played us music, and it shared news from around the world, obviously. Uh, but I don't know if any of you have ever listened to a radio show before. It's not something that happens much anymore. Uh, and even though I'm old, I'm not quite old enough to remember this is the only interaction. But I do remember we uh, had a radio show when I was a kid that we'd listen to, and the, the, it was scary stories. It was ghost stories once a week. And we really liked it as a family. We'd make time to, to listen to this when I was I know, about 10 years old or so. And it's really cool because most of, the, uh, most of the action plays out in your own imagination. You listen to it. There's actors who play the parts. There's sound effects, all of that. It's not just one person reading. Uh, but you don't see anything, right? So all the action, all the scary stuff happens in your own head. Uh, the best VR simulator right here. Maybe the only one. Um, and so it was very cool. But one thing that's interesting to, to think about in this picture is, again, it's a group. They're listening to it. You can do it by yourself, obviously, but if there's more than one person in the room, they're going to be focused on the, on the box, even though it's not look, doing anything. Our next level, obviously, is television, where we get the pictures. Uh, but again, we have uh, a group thing. 
most of you probably have experienced or do experience with your families or friends. You get together and do this, right? And it's a group thing. Uh, one thing that all of these so far have been uh, are one-way communication. Uh, the fire may be not a creator, but, but, uh, but, but after that, there's someone who created a message, something, a thought, uh, a reality, you might say, they wanted to convey. Uh, and everyone else consumes it passively. You don't interact with it on a deeper level than that. Even though we can add different screens, we can add today all kinds of different channels, uh, and we can even add species. Um, it's still a one-way communication. Uh, it's kind of funny that it works with cats, but it does. Uh, and I, it's, it works with monkeys, it works with all kinds of stuff. The reality is, is something that's, that's accessible to more than just people. Uh, it's kind of cool that way. But it's still a one-way communication. The VR that you guys are probably thinking of, that we have a few interesting examples of outside the door here, uh, is the first one that has a couple of big changes uh, that I think are important. Obviously, it's immersive. You can walk through it. It's 3D. It's a, it's a, it's a, a world that we can go through. Um, but it doesn't have to be just passive. You can actually be creating it as you interact with it. Uh, and some of the tools, you know, this guy's obviously drawing this picture. Some of the tools, you're building things. You're playing much more actively. Uh, the interaction is much deeper than even any video game that we've had uh, uh, in the past before that. And it's quite cool. Uh, but again, in most cases, you're not creating it. In most cases, the interaction looks much more like this guy. Now, I'm sure in his world, he's dodging bullets. He's James Bond. Uh, he's, you know, uh, chasing the beautiful women and beating up all the bad guys. But in, the, in our world, this is what he looks like. <laughs> Um, and this is one of the key things. It's kind of funny, this picture, but it's, it's something to remember uh, for the rest of my talk here and for maybe other, when you're developing things, uh, to think about this. Because this is what a lot of people are afraid they look like. We all want to be this guy. He looks important. He looks cool. He looks like a symphony orchestra conductor. Everyone sees that he's doing something important and cool and creative and sexy but we're afraid we're gonna be this guy, all right? <laughs> um, what is gonna happen next? I have no idea, uh, and I don't think anyone else does either. Uh, it's very much in its infancy. One of the things that I wanna answer, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm, what, what I'd like to answer is what's gonna be next? Will VR be the next big thing? Is it the iPhone just around the corner? Uh, should you guys invest your careers in it? Should I invest my money in it? I don't know, and I can't answer that. Hopefully, we can think about some things, and I'll point you towards thinking about the question in a different way that'll be useful to you. Uh, but right now, there just isn't enough data where I would feel safe saying yes, invest, or no, don't invest. Uh, I actually don't know. Um, and I don't think anyone else does either. I wouldn't listen to anyone who claims they do. Uh, people who say that this is the next big thing and they take Oculus and say, look what happened to them, look at their sales are going like this. Uh, it's way too early. Um, and it's, it's just not, there, there's a couple of reasons why I don't think it's going to be the next iPhone. But I could be wrong. Uh, we're gonna look at three key areas here. Um, the, the equipment, the gear, the fear, uh, and the hope, obviously. And the hope is interesting, and it's, it's definitely worth, uh, this isn't a negative talk, even though it might seem like it at, at certain parts. Uh, I just cer certainly want to think about barriers to acceptance, which I think are pretty big with VR, uh, where they weren't, or Apple did a very good job at, at overcoming barriers to acceptance for the for the touch phone and created an entire new world, an entire new industry, basically. Uh, and in doing so, they created an entire new language, a tactile language that people learned to, to deal with. Uh, and without that very good design of theirs, I don't think it would have worked before. Uh, it would have worked. Uh, the iPhone was not the first touch screen telephone. It was not the first smartphone. Uh, and in the world that, it's, that it came into, everyone already had phones. They really didn't need it. 
but they, they overcame all of those barriers, convinced everyone that we needed to spend twice as much money as we'd been spending on telephones, uh, and we all needed to get those, and now they pretty much changed the entire industry. They created a whole new one. I don't see that happening right now with VR. Anyway, the first thing that's important is our jobs, though. We're not going to get into the, the, that, that stuff yet, because I need to make money, you want to make money. Uh, and so these are the questions that we should be thinking about. Is this really the next thing? Is it worth investing your careers, like I said, my money, all the rest of it? Um, <clears throat> and we will see. Right now, there's definitely applications. I think that they definitely will happen for specialist things. Uh, pilots, maybe some drivers, maybe surgical training, uh, and other various very specialized stuff. It'll, uh, I think that's, that's going to happen and is happening now, but I think that's going to continue. Uh, I think there's definitely gamers and geeks always like cool toys, uh, and they've always been willing to spend money and do things interestingly. Um, but that's not mass adoption, and we need mass adoption for, for us all to have cool jobs uh, and for all, all of us to have uh, new careers and mostly for this to turn into the new iPhone, the new, the new big thing, okay? Uh, so I'm going to look, a, think about a little bit about the specialist applications and the geek toys uh, and the gamer stuff, which is all good. I'm not putting, putting that down in the slightest. Um, but mostly I've still got an eye towards what can get us over the hurdles of mass adoption uh, and if something will get us over the hurdles to mass adoption. Uh, and those are the key questions that I still have in my mind. Again, I'm thinking about this from an intellectual, from an emotional, I'm sorry, an emotional point of view. Uh, will people want to do this? What will be a strong enough lure to make people want to do this? Uh, and I don't mean by people, I mean everybody, not the people in this room, but your mothers and the people out on the streets and just ordinary, ordinary people, everyone who now has a... Uh, a, a touch phone in their pocket, will they in five years want to be doing VR on a regular basis so much that they'll have their own stuff and they, they'll buy their own apps? That's the key question. <clears throat> One thing that's really interesting, I think, that I don't see thought about very much is that when I'm dealing with my computer, it's in front of me, it's here. Keyboard is here. That's basically disposable. If I spill my coffee or my Coke on it, it's, it's okay. It's cheap. I can get another one. The main computer is in front of me somewhere, and I don't have that much physical contact with it. It's my fingertips, uh, my, you know, uh, my uh, contact with my mouse, but, but it's basically apart from me. Same thing with my phone. I hold my phone like this. I go like this. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a fairly distant contact. When I have the VR goggles on, that's much more intimate. First of all, it's taken away my entire vision and replaced it with something else. It's glued to my face. If somebody else put it on before me, uh, I might be wearing that girl's makeup right here, <laughs> right? Uh, or whatever. The other thing, the tears in the helmet, I actually heard this uh, when I was at a, uh, a conference about a year ago. I, I like to go to conferences where there's VR equipment and the general public and just watch them. I watch them interact with the, with the machinery, and I will listen to what people say about the people interacting uh, and just see what happens. This is my, my user test uh, that I can do on mass people without them knowing it. I'm a voyeur. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I actually heard someone say something about tears in the helmet, which actually I'll get to the next slide. Oops. Uh, <laughs> That's a problem when I can't see the slides. I'm doing it from memory. Um, then, uh, okay, so we'll get there in a second. These, uh, the, the assistance thing is because even out here with these guys with their, with their 3D world, uh, watch the people in line. They need help putting on the helmet. They need help getting the paddles in their hands. If I have the, uh, the earphones on, then I need help with that. If I have a cable hanging down my back, I need someone to watch that for me so I don't tangle it somewhere. Uh, this is a huge, huge barrier to mass adoption. Most of us don't have servants. 
uh, and most of us don't have servants dedicated to helping us with our, with our tech toys. Uh, and yes, you can learn to do this by yourself, but the first time you do it, you're going to have a problem. And if you have a problem and you're uncomfortable, if you're so uncomfortable the first time that you never finish it, there won't be a second time. Okay, so we all say, yeah, I can learn it, but that person needs to be motivated to get through that barrier. Uh, and I think that this is going to be a problem. Um, we need to figure out a way to make this hall easier. Partly that's a tech problem, and we'll make it wireless, we'll make it uh, a helmet that I just put on, uh, the paddles will somehow find themselves in my hand or whatever. Uh, uh, but b we'll need investment to get to that point. And it's a question of uh, what's going to come first. Uh, will the investment come first and keep pumping stuff into, keep pumping money into this so that mass adoption eventually happens? Or, or will mass adoption start paying for the investment soon enough? Uh, and that's a big question. I don't know if it'll happen soon enough. Again, with the iPhone, uh, it started being profitable almost immediately. Uh, probably by the iPhone 2, definitely the iPhone 3. Uh, it was already paying itself, paying, paying for development and becoming massively profitable. Uh, so far, VR equipment is what, maybe five years old? And I don't think it is yet. I don't think it's paying for the investment in general. Uh, so do I need an assistant? Do I need a servant for VR right now? At least my first experience, yes, for, for, uh, and that's, that's a big barrier. Here I get back to the, the, the tears in the helmet to crying in my VR. If I do it back to the intimacy of the connection with the machine, it's on my face. And if I cry, what happens to my tears? This is something that I actually heard in, in that line that I was talking about a minute ago. Um, the girl was uh, standing in line, and she, was, she didn't want to try it. For one thing, she was worried about her hair, but she was also worried, oh my God, what if I cry? What's going to happen to the tears? It's going to get caught in here, and that's one reason she didn't try it. That specific fear, I don't think, is very common. Uh, but the, 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 if you generalize that, you know, what happens if I throw up? What happens with the, my whole connection? Uh, the machine is taking over one of my senses, maybe two of my senses if I put on earphones. Uh, the whole connection is much more intimate. Um, it gives us more possibilities to do stuff, to do cool things, but it also takes away more of my autonomy, more of my, what, individuality in a way, my, 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 my independence, my awayness from the machine. <laughs> Uh, and that's a little bit exaggerated, I guess. It's not, it doesn't have to be a scary thing, but for some people, uh, I, in, in, I think it is, and to some degree, for most of us, there's a little bit, there's some level of resistance, more or, or, more or less, depending on who. <clears throat> and this is a huge one. Nobody wants to look stupid, uh, and everybody, face it, looks stupid when you strap a brick to your face. Uh, we're just not made to look good that way. Uh, and right now, that's, that's, that's the cost of VR. You have to have a big thing right there. Um, again, the iPhone. One of the things they did absolute, br absolutely brilliantly was they made this whole thing sexy. Uh, having Apple has always known how to do this. They used to make computers that were more expensive than PCs, but only the artsy designer types had them. The young, sexy people had Apples. The boring engineers had PCs. Uh, and so Apple knew how to do this very well, and they did it with the iPhone extremely well. Uh, and one of the things they did superbly was the ringtone. Uh, most of you, I guess, are too young to remember when the, when the iPhone started emerging into the market in the world where we all had Nokias or, or whatever in those days. We didn't need the phone. Uh, we, so the people who wanted it already had smartphones. We could already chat. We could already take pictures, all of that stuff. Uh, and at, uh, at the time, it felt good enough. Uh, what was genius was the ringtone, because everyone knew that Apple was coming out with this phone. We knew it was expensive. And if you were on a bus or in a restaurant or in class or any crowded place and you heard that do 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 you know, that Apple ringtone, um, you started to look. Somebody's got an iPhone. Oh, it's that guy. He's cool. I want to be like him, <laughs> right? It, it was amazing. It wasn't so much that I wanted that phone, it's I wanted to be important just like that guy. 
because he's got an app. He has the ringtone in his in his you know in his pocket. Absolute genius, right? I don't see that happening with a brick on my face. And what about my hair? Especially girls, but more guys these days have have hairdos that are actually important to them. They put in gel, you know, all this stuff. Uh, you strap that whole thing on your head, and it screws it up. And the paddles? That's just weird. You know, it's, it's, it's an interaction that's not difficult to learn, but, you know, why not gloves? Why not uh, something, you know, RFIDs on my fingernails or something? There, there, there seems to be so much more natural interaction that's, that's easily doable that would just make this whole thing more simple. Um, and I don't think it, you could even make disposable gloves, so I don't have to worry about that icky person before me playing this game. Uh, you know, where his hands were, or hers, whatever. Um, so these are just thoughts that ran through my head while I was thinking about it, but they're all, each one is a little minus, a little negative in, in the way I see it. And lots of little negatives add up to just, I don't want to bother with it. <clears throat> Coming back to the cool, we have to have something for mass adoption, for something that makes me feel like I'm sexier. Uh, and that's what it really does come down to. It's what the iPhone did brilliantly. What Apple, fi uh, what uh, Google finally caught up with. Their first Androids really sucks. They were absolutely useless, but they they quickly caught up, uh, and they got through the geek phase for a while. For a while, Android was kind of like the Linux of uh, of the uh, of the of the mobile world. But now they're they're definitely they've got their cool factor there too. There's nice and expensive phones that show how rich I am, I'm so, or, or you know I'm, I'm rich enough to spend a lot of money on a on a piece of piece of plastic that I'm going to throw away in a year, uh, and give me high status and all of that stuff. <clears throat> um, and mostly, it's something that I can use every day. I can convince myself that it's actually worth the money every day, so I reinforce my own belief that it's worth spending the money. I show everyone in the world how cool I am, because I can say, hey, this, this, this conference, this is about you, so I'm going to pull out my phone because I want to take a picture of you, but actually I want to show you how cool I am because I have this phone here. So, you know. um, and we can reinforce these mutual beliefs in, in, all the time. Uh, and there's no safety issue with a phone, unless I'm, well, there's some safety issues when driving and texting and stuff like that, uh, but in general, I'm pretty safe with VR. Am I going to uh, fall over something? Am I going to trip over something if I'm using it? I can take I can take care. I know that some of the systems have certain zones that I map out it, that, that, that it'll notify me when I get close to the edge. But just the idea that I have to worry about that, you know, I have to think about safety concerns. It's another it's another issue. It's definitely not a sexy thing. If I use it in the office. Uh, are my idiot friends going to do something? Are they going to put uh, shaving cream on my head? Uh, are they going to fill my coffee with styrofoam peanuts or, or whatever? And you know what? I would. So, you know, I know somebody else is going to do it. <laughs> uh, it's too hard to resist. The guy who thinks he's all serious and doing business stuff with a brick on his face, and we know what he's looking at, right? We can't see it, but we kind of know what he's looking at, and it's not spreadsheets in there. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> How are we going to do business? And that's another thing. You know, with, uh, with all the technological advances we've had in the past, we've had the mass appeal because it makes us feel cool and sexy. And then there's also the business appeal that actually does our, our companies buy it uh, by the thousands a piece because they need it or because they think they need it. Um, but again, the VR just doesn't have this aspect. It doesn't have this driver. <coughs> And what happens if I get sick? Because it actually does happen. There's various ways you can make people actually throw up, uh, make them get dizzy. You can give people epileptic seizures. Uh, you can give them panic attacks. People who've never had panic attacks will get them uh, with, with VR stuff on, uh, depending on what's going on. Uh, because especially... In the first few times you use it, if you do something like a flight simulator or a, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, 
uh, say it. A roller coaster. That's it. I could say it in Czech. I was thinking of it in Czech, but I couldn't think of it in English. Uh, a roller coaster, or any of those things that you know rapidly change your perspective, uh, or flicker rates that are wrong, or various other things. Um, your brain just doesn't know how to deal with it at first. It very quickly actually is interesting. It very quickly catches up and learns that this isn't real, so you don't feel dizzy after a few minutes. But those first few minutes are, again, the first ones. And if you never get past those, you don't get to the 10th minute. Um, and just the fear of that uh, is going to block some people. So one of the things I was thinking about uh, to, to get over these fear factors uh, is coming up with standards. Um, most of you are too young to remember the early days of the internet before we knew how to make a standard link on a, on a text page. Uh, but somebody came up with making it blue and making it underlined. I have no idea who that was. Um, but that was just one of the first. There were several ideas of how to, how to make that obvious, and that one just caught on and stayed. And it was fine. It became a standard. So maybe, as a dumb idea, but instead of absolute VR, we have sort of a little bit of bleed through AR kind of thing, a little bit of real reality coming through. And, you know, I could have this, this pillow be outlined in a blue underlined thing, like a, like a web page, so that I know if I kick it, something's actually gonna happen in the real world. You know, maybe, maybe I'll trip over it, or maybe there's a hole in the ground that's outlined in blue, and I better not step in that because it's a real hole, right? So maybe that's something we can do that makes, makes people feel safer because we have standards. And no matter what system I put on my head, I'll always know that there's something, some interaction with the real world. Uh, and that's just a thought. Uh, I don't know if it's a good one or not. That's the, the fuzzy border. Uh, maybe there shouldn't be, uh, for, for standard, standard stuff, home usage, maybe there shouldn't be absolute VR. Uh, that actually blocks off my, my contact with the physical world. Um, you know, uh, maybe, maybe we need some way uh, of having the real world come through. Uh, and I was thinking of this. Personally, I don't even like to put on headphones and listen to loud music on headphones because I have kids. Uh, they're older now, but when they were little, I needed to know when the baby was crying. Uh, and after a couple of years of just being trained to listen for that, it's hard to forget. You know, my, my youngest is nine years old now, so I don't have to worry about it. But seriously, after, you know, three years, four years of, oh my God, is somebody crying? I gotta go check that out. You just, you, as a parent, you're, in, you're conditioned for life. You never get rid of that. Um, and uh, so, you know, the doorbell rings, whatever. The, something catches fire in the kitchen and I gotta hear that, you know, uh, whatever. So I don't even like headphones anymore. Uh, so have it, feeling confident that emergencies will get through my VR experience and tell me that something's on fire would make me feel com more comfortable. Maybe it's just a parental thing, I don't know, but for young people, maybe you don't need to worry about that yet. Um, another thing I was thinking of is maybe we have a special place and ritual and time to do VR, kind of like v uh, meditation, where I have a special room set up that I know is safe, once I close the door, there's no tables that I'm going to trip over. My cables, if I need cables, or my equipment is put away in a way that I'm not going to negatively interact with my hardware. <laughs> uh, and when I'm there, you know, I'll have someone that's there taking care of the baby or, uh, or whatever. I'll just know that I don't have to worry about emergencies and I can shut myself off. That might be another way of doing it. But that means having special time and place just for this, which again is a luxury most of us don't have in real life. Um, <coughs> and again, that's something that the iPhone didn't need. That's something, you know, I've got it in my pocket all the time. So uh, this, is, this is all, even if we s solve this in such a way, it's again a barrier uh, to, to mass adoption. I need to know, you know to, uh, that I'm not going to be made a fool of, that I'm not going to look like an ass in front of everybody here. Uh, this is a very important thing, and I think it's one of the most important motivators uh, in human life. We don't acknowledge it overtly, but how much do we think about it? Uh, if I, if looking, looking at the crowd here, we're all dressed more or less the same. 
Why? Because we don't want to look like a jackass in front of the, in front of the crowd here. Uh, my wife told me to bring a suit. I'm like, are you nuts? It's going to be a bunch of IT people. I'm going to look like an old man in a suit. They're not going to listen to me. I need to wear T-shirts. You know, same thing. Uh, it doesn't make me any younger, but it <laughs> makes me feel like I'm more acceptable, and that's, my, that's, that's the important thing. Uh, it gets over my, my, my talking in front of crowd fears. If I had to put on something silly, then, you know. <laughs> uh, we have enormous drives to not look silly. We do huge things to not look silly, and we don't even know it, right? So that's a really important thing, and I think VR really needs to work to get over that, because right now I think at least half the people won't even try it because they're afraid of looking silly. Uh, they won't try it in a store, they won't try it anywhere else, and that, way, that means they're not going to buy it to take it home and try it in private. And of course, I don't want to break my leg either, so I do need to make sure that when I get to the edge of the stage with the VR glasses, I'm not going to take that one more step, and uh, I, need to be, I need to feel safe that way. Some of the positives that I think right now, if I was going to invest in VR, uh, career-wise, time-wise, money-wise, whatever, uh, and it's one thing that if I was starting my career, if I was advising someone starting their career, uh, and they are interested in this. Um, these are these are things that I think are interesting points. A couple of points that I'm going to bring up here because I think that they are points where the benefit is pretty close to outweighing the the barriers, so that the payoff is is good and immediate. Uh, when I say the payoff, most people do not think well about the future. Uh, you guys are exceptions. You're in school, so you're willing to suffer in school for a few years so that you're better off in the future. Most people don't do that very well. That's why losing weight is, a, is, a, is almost impossible for, almost mo for most people. It's why saving money is difficult for people. Uh, the, 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 the lure of the immediate payoff, uh, the immediate feel good, is so much stronger. You know, I might want to lose five kilos, but that piece of chocolate just looks so damn good, I'm going to eat it anyway. Uh, I know it's bad for me, whatever. You know, I want to save money for a car, but I really want to spend that money on something else right now, so screw it, right? Uh, so the, the payoff has to be immediate, uh, and if we get to the, the long-term payoff, then that's great, but we need to have the immediate one. Uh, I'm going to see if these things work. These are some videos here. Can we play that? <laughs> it's not VR. How come? There we go. Ah, I got the hand. <laughs> Could skip to about 35 seconds. I thought this was already set. For little kids, they don't care about makeup, they don't care about their hair, and they really don't care about looking stupid. In fact, they like that. So, this is cool. Uh, edutainment. Showing them history, showing them science, and anything else that you can think of. This is where, where, where designers can get really creative and do some amazing things um, to get kids interested and teach them real stuff. Uh, kids, you know, you ever see them learn about dinosaurs? Uh, absolutely useless crap, but they'll tell you every single thing about dinosaurs there is to know uh, if they're interested in it, and this can do that. Um, and then there's other stuff. I don't know if anybody ever here played Call of Duty or any of those World War II uh, war games, but some of those battles were designed, around, designed by guys who actually were in those battles, and they can tell you that the sniper up there in the corner was really there, so, they, so, the, desi so the game designers put a sniper up in that corner, and it, it gives you a feeling much deeper of what it was like in certain situations than reading about it or hearing stories or seeing movies or anything else. You get, a, you get a much deeper sensation of what it was like. With VR, uh, that I think is going to be a really deep possibility. The challenge here is to make it interesting, fun, and educational. So it really is edutainment, not just entertainment. Uh, but I think that's going to be a big possibility. Fantasy, fantasy fulfillment and, and uh, experience replacement. 
Uh, this one's kind of obvious. Um, helping people do things that they will probably never do in real life. Uh, obviously, flight simulators and whatnot. Uh, and a few other things that, uh, that, that, are, that are popular. Um, we have this in television, we have this all over the place. Uh, travel shows, all kinds of stuff like this is very cool, but there's one specific niche that I think is my favorite for investing in, uh, and that is this. Uh, can you see that picture? Ah, shit. Did, uh, you guys don't have this? Okay. Anyway, too bad. I'll show it to anybody who's interested. I'll show it to you on my computer. <laughs> uh, what it is, I'll, des I'll describe it. Virtual reality and the, this will be virtual, virtual reality. Uh, uh, well, um, it's an old lady on her deathbed in an old folks home. And the people showed her, uh, she, she had moved to England, I believe it is, and grew, she grew up in France, I think. And they showed her her, her home village uh, on VR. And she hadn't been there in 60 or 70 years. I think she left after the Second World War or during it and hadn't been home since. So she got to see her village as it is today. They showed her her house and, you know, they did this for a BBC special. Uh, so they actually did it very personalized for her. But to see her reactions was just magical. It, it was wonderful just to see how she really interacted with it and very quickly believed. Uh, well, obviously she didn't fully believe she was there, but she, she became immersed in being there. Uh, and seeing this was, was amazing. Uh, again, she didn't care about her hair, she didn't care about her makeup, she didn't care about looking stupid, she's already strapped to a bunch of tubes and wires and stuff like that. You can't look much worse in that, in that situation. Uh, and her joy was so huge. Uh, the world's population is aging, there is massive money in this, in this population group, uh, and I think that the conditions here are perfect, absolutely perfect for a niche uh, of VR development, uh, especially if you can make the stuff more comfortable, but they're also lying in bed, so the safety factors are eliminated, um, or they're, they're sitting in a wheelchair, or at least not terribly mobile. They're probably not going to get up and dance through the cables and stuff like that. Um, and the payoff that for the people in this situation is so huge. Uh, that that the, the barrier just disappears. There is no barrier here. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's, again, I'll, I'll show you the video if, if you, yeah, you can just see the picture as I jump there, uh, but it disappears too quickly. So I'm sorry about that. That was, that, that was my big payoff video too. Uh, but anyway, the other thing that I wanted to show you really quickly before I, before I finish here is we were just... Uh, uh, at the Google Developer Days in Poland a couple of days ago where they announced a new AR system, AR core they call it, that's going to be sort of like a next generation to Tango to anyone who knows what I'm talking about. And it'll be accessible on any Android phone with Android 7 or better. So right now you need a pretty good phone but not a fantastic specialized one. Uh, so that eliminates one of the barriers and uh, basically this is the stuff it can do. I have not had time to play with it, so I can't tell you much deeper what it can do. Um, but it does map sur surfaces. Uh, you can put that, that little map, that little uh, uh, mountain on the tabletop. You can walk around it. The phone will remember where it is if you walk away and then you point your phone there again. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff. They have animations on this link here. Uh, and again, you can either copy that down or I'll give it to you later or you just look for it on AR Core. Uh, it can do some very cool things on some very accessible technology. You don't need anything special. Uh, and a year or two from now, all the Android phones will be, will be equipped with this, all the new ones. Um, so this, I think, is a, is a very promising thing. In short, I think AR is more promising than VR as a general purpose thing. Uh, but for anyone thinking about designing it, I would focus on the payoff, on the emotional. Why would I, as a user, want to use it? Cool technology is only going to sell it to geeks, uh, which is fine if that's what you want to sell to. But if you want mass adoption, it need, you need to think about uh, why do I want to use it? Why do I want to learn it? And is it fun from the very first interaction? And that's all I've got to say. Questions? More, more, more. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> 
Okay, there's a, that was the first Questions? one I saw. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Hey, so thank you very much. It was just an amazing presentation. And uh, if you were speaking from the emotional point of view, I have uh, a question from emotional point of view too. Mm -hmm. So uh, as Don't I'm, make me cry. Okay. <laughs> and so as I understood, uh, you have been working with it uh, for a while, for a, probably for a long 25, time. 25, 30 years. Whoa. So, I am uh, old. <laughs> what did you feel when you was uh, first time, when you had a possibility to work with it, and which prediction did you have uh, for this um, technology, and um, what did you what did you feel about it? Wh which which prediction? Uh, I mean, Dis uh, did, uh, did you prediction say? about the future of virtual reality and um, and artificial. Oh, yeah, and uh, AR, I forgot how to. Um, well, this isn't the first time virtual reality has been promised. Uh, it's something that's pretty much been promised, is just around the corner, almost as long as I can remember in my, for 20 years. Uh, so I'm just a little bit skeptical in general. This definitely is by far the biggest, uh, what, spike? In virtual in, in, in VR uh, the biggest investment the technology is there so it's it's got more staying power now what did I predict uh, I think when I first read Neuromancer and I started uh, hearing about people putting uh, chips in their head in like 1989 uh, that you know that by 2000 we were all just gonna be able to learn Russian by sticking a chip in my head and I'll be able to talk Russian for the weekends here now you know um, that hasn't happened, and all of technological stuff is always slower than the predictions. It's never as cool and as fast and as complete as people predict. That's, that's been my most consistent experience. Um, and most of my predictions are conservative. I, I, it's, I, I'd love to say I, sp I spotted every new trend and said, yes, that's going to be it, and I was right every time. Uh, usually, when the internet started, I didn't think it was going to be as big as it is. Now that sounds so incredibly stupid to say, but in those days, I mean, you know, why would people spend money on something like that when they already have everything they've got, they need, right? Uh, and with, with mobiles, I didn't fix, yeah, I, I, the first time I heard of a camera being attached to a mobile, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard, because, you know, I had an SLR and I have a phone. I'm like, why would I put the two things together? That sounds so incredibly dumb, <laughs> right? Well, so, okay. So, you know, take all of this as a, as a grain of salt. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm not trying to predict. I'm just raising questions today. <laughs> and uh, I understand that you never regret of it. You, hmm? did, you, did never, uh, you never regretted of it. Because, uh, I mean, you, feel, uh, you talked with the, about it with uh, such an ins inspiration and <laughs> satisfaction that... This guy's uh, going to win, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I really believe that you feel that you may probably make a world better and uh, I, I understand your feelings I mean so uh, cynically most of my career has been spent making rich people richer and I'm not one of them uh, you know that's 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 the way it is when you work for somebody else yeah. <laughs> uh, I did most of my work for banks um, and uh, I like the work I do I like UX I like thinking about the human side of the technology um, so yeah I do like what I do <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Uh -huh. This guy over here had a question. <laughs> okay, next time just stand up and point. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think if, you, if we will add face search in uh, AI, will it be ethical? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, will, uh, will it be ethical if we will add by search into AR? If we add search into AR, will it be ethical? Ooh, ethics is a hard one, especially um, when Google paid for me to come here. <laughs> uh, the short answer is yes. The, the long answer is it depends on how it's done. If it's really search, I don't, if it's search for the, cons for the person's needs, 
I don't have a problem with it. If it's search that tracks the person and uses that to sell data without his explicit and knowing and understanding permission, I don't mean checking a box where you have 500 pages of stuff that nobody reads, but if I really want to be tracked, then that's ethical. If that's what I actually want, if I understand the consequences and if I want it. Today, that is such a muddy question, and it's a good question. Um, but it goes way beyond uh, the medium, AR or, or anything else. I think search and all that tracking stuff that the companies do very often goes over the edge into, into not ethical, uh, a lot of the stuff they do. I mean, I just, I just got a new phone, and looking at all the permissions uh, you know, for my camera, I had to, to, to make the camera work. I had to give it permission to get to my, my friends list. Like, why the hell does it have to have to know my friends? That's a, it's a damn camera. <laughs> you know? uh, if I want to share it with a sharing app, then I have to give it. I understand that. But my camera doesn't have to know shit. It has to know what it's, it has to see the, the, you know, through the lens, and that's it. So, you know. But Facebook have technology to find every face in Facebook. Uh, yep, so does Google. And uh, one of the reasons that it's hard to develop that technology for anyone else is because Google and Facebook actively buy up every, every patent that comes close. So they're actively keeping it out of other people's hands. Um, yeah, if I owned the world, then maybe I would change that. But I'm just a little guy up here on this little stage. and They, they don't ask me about those things. <laughs> But thanks. There's a, up here, there's this gentleman in the gray shirt about five rows back who has been very actively trying to get attention, so good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for amazing presentation. And uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you think in future uh, VR devices can connect it to each other so people can be in one space, uh -huh. one space and uh, see each other maybe? I think that would be very cool if it worked. Uh, and in some ways, it already does. Uh, I have friends who have uh, virtual drinking parties over, over Skype, uh, where they'll each have their bottle of whiskey and they'll you know, sit there and talk and drink all night and they'll be all over the world. So that, that already happens to a, two, a 2D degree. <laughs> uh, creating the environment like, um, does anybody here remember Second Life? <laughs> uh, there's one nodding, you're old. <laughs> Not as old as some, but uh, there was Second Life, which was a world in the, uh, about the late 90s uh, that tried to be that, and for a while it looked like it was going to be that, and, suddenly, and somehow it disappeared, and I don't know why. Uh, but that was a whole world that people built, and it was so big that big companies, uh, large banks uh, and all that, were building virtual um, storefronts, uh, and there were people who were becoming millionaires by selling stuff in Second Life. Uh, and they had their own virtual money that, that, was, you know, that was making governments uh, nervous because people were becoming millionaires in virtual money that they could change untaxed into real money and all of this stuff. So, and then it all disappeared. So I think the potential is there. I think there is a big enough market for people to do it. The execution, I think, is key. How, how it's done, how easy it is, how fun it is. Uh, how safe it is uh, and how dangerous it can be because I think actually danger is part of the lure for a lot of people you know some people go to the bad part of town just to see if they can survive it right so uh, so making everything like Disneyland is good for some people but it's terrible for others so so there has to be you know to make it to make it feel like real life you'd have to give people the choice um, and I don't know if I'm answering your question now but I think it's possible <laughs> thank you okay this guy, yep. Yep, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, and uh, what perspectives for using VR for training some skills, uh, maybe for training cost enough, so training um, eyesight or something healthy? Uh, I don't understand the question. What, the, what are the costs of training? Um, mm. Uh -huh. So this is the question, will we feel better in the IT if we use more and don't feel that feedback now? There are some interesting things with that. Uh, the question is, if, if I understand the question, is if we, if we will feel less sick or if we will feel less VR sickness in the future if we use it more. Yeah. yeah? Um, 
Partly yes. The more you use it, the more the body gets used to it. Uh, we're actually somehow built in with VR smarts. Um, and people very fairly quickly in long-term testing get over a lot of their VR stuff. And it's interesting, uh, specifically VR uh, emotions. One of the things that was interesting is they, they were teaching, uh, there's a military app to train soldiers to instantly react and decide who to shoot and who not to shoot. Uh, and one of the problems was that the, at first that the soldiers felt too much sympathy for the target and couldn't shoot. Uh, so even though they knew that it was virtual, even though they knew it was a video game, they wouldn't shoot the target fast enough uh, for real life training. Uh, so even the empathy bled through. Uh, but as they kept doing it, they found out that, the, that this very quickly uh, went away after, after about 10 uh, applications. Uh, it's like Pavlov's dogs, right? They got the negative reinforcement that nothing bad happened so I can go ahead and shoot. The big question now is whether that'll get into real life and they'll just go out and shoot people anyway and think that there's no, no bad reaction to it or not. That I don't know yet. Uh, so I think that, yes, if we use VR more, we'll have less of the physical sickness, we'll have, but we'll also get less of the benefit of emotional training uh, as we realize that it is VR, right? Uh, but as a, as a barrier to mass adoption, it still is there because it's the, at the very beginning. Right, so on the barriers right here, I'll never get to the, the good trends because I don't want to puke in front of my friends. <laughs> Unless I'm uh, drunk. <laughs> the Google Translate, translate a uh, key word in my equation like uh, uh, vestibulator apparatus. <laughs> I, I understood radost, but I didn't understand what was before that. <laughs> okay, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Your next question. So, uh, as far as I understood, uh, your perspective of UX design is emotions, am mm -hmm. I right? So, is it, is it easy to design by emotions? Where did you study it? I mean, like, how do you know this, this image helps this emotion and this image helps another one? Like, I know it's kind of intuitively, and it's easy to understand it intuitively, but when you're building a large app, so a huh? huge, uh, some, Something huge, how do you, what did, did you read to understand this? <laughs> or where did you study? Uh, I actually studied mainframe programming with a specialty in assembler and COBOL. Uh, the least emotional thing you could possibly imagine. <laughs> but um, since then, th where did I study is in the world. Uh, I watch people. Uh, I see how they interact with systems, uh, not just computer systems, uh, and I, I actively observe people. Um, but uh, as far as designing for emotion, some people say that's impossible. I say, look at a successful restaurant and tell me he's not designing for emotion. Uh, a good restaurant, you don't go there just for the food and maybe not even for the food at all. You go there because it's fun. You go there because the people are nice. You go there because the atmosphere is good. And a successful restaurant owner has known this for thousands of years uh, before there was anything such as UX, right? Uh, artists. They're, they are emotion designers. Um, when you do a painting or a ballet or a song, you're, you're working directly on the emotion. If you look, if you read the words of a lot of songs, they're stupid as hell. But if you listen to the song and you don't listen, you don't analyze the words, suddenly you're, you're crying all over the place or you're laughing or you want to fall in love, right? I mean, that's exactly what they are. They are designers for emotion right there. How they do it? Maybe they have talents, maybe they have intuition, maybe they have a clever algorithm, I don't know. Uh, as far as with software, you design the same way. A designer starts with his own intuition always. That's the only place to begin, whether you're a technical designer or not. Uh, unless you're gonna design something that's already been designed and proven, you have to begin with intuition somehow. And then you test. Uh, we do, I do lots of user testing. My other, my, my main my technical specialty is user research. Uh, so I test my prototypes, uh, I see how people react. If it's the way that I want them to react, then I keep moving in that direction. If it's not, then I try something different. Uh, but I basically have to take it to people and see how they react um, and, and watch them react with, with my system that I design. So it's, it's something you can gain experience only in the real world. You can read a book about this and 
being clever. It's something you just can gain uh, in the real world or you can have it or not. There are some books uh, and training that I would recommend for anyone interested in learning what this is. But yes, I mean, ultimately you need to figure it out yourself uh, and how you do it. It's, you know, how does one artist is going to go uh, a different way than another artist and both of them can be successful. Thank you. Right? Hmm? Yeah, last question? Uh, one more, one more. One more, okay. Okay. I'll be around so we can talk. Yeah, you can talk after you speak around. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, can you tell me what Google, uh, what Google are planning now for VR and uh, what we should expect uh, from VR soon? That's a really hard one. What Google did now, I showed you the AR core, which is the latest thing. Uh, and like I said, I can't tell you much about that because I came back from Poland yes the day before yesterday and flew to Russia yesterday, so I haven't had time to play with it yet. Um, but uh, what I think is coming up are some of the applications that I, that I mentioned. Uh, stuff for old and hospitalized and bedridden people. Um, I think there is going to be, this is still long term, maybe five years or more, but things that are, will replace senses. Uh, there are blind people who can see with their tongue. There's a, a colorblind pr a guy who has an antenna that vibrates in his head that helps him, dis helps him see or at least understand colors. I don't know how he perceives them. Yeah, you're looking at me like I have three heads, but the guy who said, there's a mountain climber who's completely blind. He can't even see light and darkness. And he has a thing that's like a, th like a dot matrix printer on his tongue that he uses that, that stimulates the visu vision centers in his brain and he can climb cliffs, he can climb mountains, he's a free climber. Uh, there's another guy who, who does, uh, uh, he clicks with his tongue, like that. He does, um, he, he, can, he can ride a bike, he's blind, you can find him on the internet. Uh, so I think there's going to be applications that use VR to stimulate different parts of the brain like that. And I think those are interesting things. Uh, and of course, if they work in a therapeutic environment, they're going to start being used in an entertainment environment and stuff like that. Uh, one thing that I have not seen in 3D movies that I think will happen in 3D movies and will also start happening in VR is artists doing completely different things. They're not going to simulate three-dimensional space like they do now, they're going to do something completely different as artists do uh, and completely just fuck with your head. <laughs> uh, in a three, we're using the 3D and VR as a medium and I have no idea what that is because I'm really not an artist, so I just think that's gonna happen. Um, beyond that, commercial applications, I think we're definitely going to see those things. I think we're going to see something like Google Glass come back, Facebook I think, or one of those applications, not Facebook, uh, uh, somebody has something that's like Google, Google Glass, the, the VR, the AR um, glasses that you wear. Uh, something like that's gonna come back, I think, because it's too much of a commercial idea. Uh, and that, that's going to be, I think, unethical. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be heavy advertising and stuff like that. Um, and that's, that's about it I can say in the next two minutes, in, in, the, in two minutes. Thank you, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, could you please uh, choose uh, three uh, best questions? Uh, guys, stand up, please, who asked the questions. Three best questions. Okay, I think the emotion question there was definitely interesting. So this fellow in the black on my left. Ooh, you get a blue cup. Excellent. Um, I think the lady in the back there with the 3D worlds and this fellow with the persistence. Lady in black. And of course, everybody's question was great, and I only have three to choose, and I, th th this is a very interesting way of putting the speaker on the spot and making me feel really good about it. So <laughs> but thank you all for, uh, for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's uh, for you. Uh, welcome to Voronezh. Welcome to Russia. Enjoy you. Uh, please, thank you. Uh, and right now, uh, у нас перерыв. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much.